Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Trek Canon. So with the Strange New Worlds premiering tomorrow, what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about the full circle that we're probably going to end up going into with Captain Pike. And when I say the full circle, everybody who is familiar with Star Trek Canon knows what will eventually happen to Pike once his tour is over. <laughs> So, since we all know that that's going to be the case, let's talk a little bit about the mini-movie from the original series episodes. And that mini-movie is The Cage and the Menageries, Part 1 and 2. Now, how should this mini-movie be viewed? It should be viewed The Menagerie, Part 1, then The Cage, and then ending with The Menagerie, Part 2. Now, we all know the history behind The Cage, um, it being the first pilot episode, right, uh, chronology, well, written-wise, it was the first Star Trek episode. And the reason that it wasn't aired the way that it was supposed to be aired was because it was deemed too cerebral. Now, when I was a kid, I had to sit down and had to have a conversation with Miriam and Webster about what cerebral meant. Because the only other times that I had seen that word was when I was reading X-Men comic books and Professor X hooked themselves up to one of them, right? And then the other time when I was trying to figure out what cerebellum meant. But anyway, that's besides the point. So I guess ultimately my question about this mini movie would simply be this. Is it better to live free but caged or to live caged but free? And I guess that boils down the essence of what this mini movie is about and the dilemma facing Captain Christopher Pike and Commander Spock. So right off the bat with this mini movie, over the years and decades that I've talked to people and, you know, attended many conventions and just sit down in groups and stuff like that with other Trekkies. Let me tell you some of the uh, questions that usually come up when dealing with this with this episode. How much of this um, mini movie was illusion? How much was being fed to us by the Telosians? Why did Spock decide to do this? Why did he decide to betray his Captain Kirk? Why did he decide to betray Captain Pike? Why did he betray um, his oath to Starfleet? How long was Spock in contact with the Telosians? Because he had a whole plan set up. Like, and it was some stuff that the Telosians had to be involved with because of the things that was going on on the view screen and the fact that uh, the Commodore ended up getting on a shuttle with Captain Kirk. And I guess the final question would be, how far does the Telosian telepathy manipulation work? How many light years? Because between the station and Talos IV, that was a very big difference in space. So... First off, Captain Christopher Pike. He was the second captain of the 1701 Enterprise. And the thing is, after his five-year mission, he decided to go back to Starfleet where he became an instructor. Uh, because of something that happened, an accident that happened with the cadets, he ended up getting a lethal, a lethal dose of Delta radiation, I believe it was. And the thing about it is, is that he has four cognitive abilities. It's just that his body doesn't work. You could think of him as an extreme case of a paraplegic. And I'll let Bones describe it even better. Now that man can think any thought that we can. Love, hope, dream as much as we can. But he can't reach out and no one can reach in. Now, notice what Bones said, all right? And if you want to get more into, uh, I guess, the the scientific or medical explanation of what's going on with look look at what the the commodore said totally unable to move jim his wheelchair is constructed to respond to his brain waves or he can turn it move it forwards backwards slightly 
Through the flashing light, he can say yes or no. But that's it, Jim. That's as much as that poor devil can do. His mind is as active as yours and mine. But it's trapped inside a useless vegetating body. He's kept alive mechanically. A battery-driven heart. This is the thing. We go back to that original question that I asked. Is it better to be free but caged, restricted to your wheelchair, free of thought and everything like that, though, or to be caged but free? Now, I'll get into the second part of that question shortly, but there's some stuff that we have to talk about. In this mini movie, I like to say that there are three major players. It is Commander Spock, it is Captain Christopher Pike, and it is the Talosians. All right. Now, the reason why I don't say Kirk is part of this is because Kirk is basically fed a distraction and used as a means of uh, telling us what's going on, why it's going on. All right, let's point out some obvious flaws between Strange New Worlds and the original series. Because anybody who watched this episode, they asked, hey, man, do you know? They asked Kirk, hey, man, do you know Pike? And he was like, no, I only met him like once. But in Strange New Worlds, they have it seem like they have a relationship. Spock knew Pike for 11 years. All right, so we got some time in between the things that happens in Star Trek Strange New Worlds and what ends up happening, the cage. So what is a lie. I think that we have to start this out when dealing with the first person, Spock, right? It has always been said that Vulcans are incapable of telling a lie. My dad used to say that if a Vulcan lied, he would die, all right? Now, Kirk talks about it a little bit better. Miss Piper, a Vulcan can no sooner be disloyal than he can exist without breathing. That goes for his present commander as well as his past. But the thing is, like Kirk mentions in the episode, Spock is half human. The simple fact that he's a Vulcan means he's incapable of telling a lie. He is also half human. And that half is completely submerged. To be caught acting like us or even thinking like us would completely embarrass. The thing about it is this. To lie is to deceive, all right? To mislead. Everything that Spock did in this episode, right, short of him sitting at the court-martial table, Right, even setting up the situation that caused him to be able to show the images that the Telosians are sending was all misleading. It was all a lie. And this is the thing about Spock that I want people to understand. Spock will force his will upon people. All right. Spock will say, Spock will look at uh, something and be like, okay, hey, this is logical. This, because of these boundaries that I placed this in, Right. I need to do this. Think about when uh, Kirk fell in love, became head over heels with the uh, with the creation of Methuselah. All right. Um, now, the thing is, is that he was heartbroken really bad. And Spock took it upon himself because he felt that having a captain being distracted that way would not work well for the ship. He took it upon himself to assault Kirk without his knowledge and remove those memories. So you guys got to understand that if Spock thinks it is for the best of the ship and crew, he will do it. He don't care how anybody feels about it. He don't care, you know, none of that. The good of the many is always something that Spock has always held true. The good of the many. But what happened here? One could ask where, at what point did the Telosians start exerting influence. Now, if you watch the Menagerie 1 and 2, you will know that before they even got to the space station, Spock had this planned out, right? Which means that he already knew that what he had to do, what he had to do with Pike, how it was going to go down, uh, uh, the ramifications of all of this and everything. And he must have known that the Telosians would accept Pike. How did he know that if the, if the Telosians and him weren't in contact prior to uh, Spock faking, a, faking receiving a, sim, a signal from Pike from the space station. That being said, that would imply that the Telosians' telepathy or their ability to um, contact or communicate with at least another highly uh, telepathic species, which is the Vulcans, can go over light years of distance. 
if you pay attention to the episode, Spock knew he look. He was like, "Look, I can't have Kirk on this ship. I gotta leave Kirk on the station because I know if I bring Kirk on this on the ship, it's gonna be problems with what I'm trying to do. It's gonna be a lot of problems with what I'm trying to do." So he decides to continue on with his misleading, right, or what was called a lie, acting arbitrary to what how a Vulcan would act. All right, so. He proceeds to say, all right, I'm going to need Kirk to stay on this planet, man, and I commandeer the whole enterprise. Now, the thing about it is this. Spock should have known what Kirk would do. Kirk, he knew Kirk. He, he should have knew Kirk would have been like, hey, man, look, something's going on here. I'm not the type of person to just let some stuff go. There's a reason that I'm here on this station. Y'all need to check everything, because if my first officer says that he received a message, that's what we mean, man. I got a Vulcan first officer. I know him. And so y'all need to check y'all computers. Think about that for a second. This dude has so much trust that Kirk is like, look, y'all check y'all computers, double check, check the impossible, all this kind of stuff. Before he even brought it into his mind that Spock could be misleading him. Eventually, right, Spock ends up commandeering a vessel. You know, he don't do it as smooth as, say, a data would do it. But he still is able to commandeer the vessel. You know, pretty cool. Like, and... What I wanted people to pay attention to is at some point, Kirk was like, hey, um, I'm going to go chase this ship. I'm going to go steal a shuttle, which does not have warp capability, but I'm going to steal it anyway. And I'm going to go follow the Enterprise because something's not right. Now, this is the thing. Why would the Commodore, the head of the entire station, decide to board the shuttle as well. I mean, he has a whole entire station to run, okay? So one can assume from that point right there, that point right there where Kirk got on, this, on, on the shuttle, everything from that point all the way through was influenced by the Telosians. So let's talk a little bit about the Telosians, all right, from Talos IV. The Telosians are extremely powerful telepaths, all right? If you were to put the only people who would probably stand a chance at at being on their level that is not an omnipotent being or some type of uh, ascended being or something like that in Star Trek would probably be Tam Elburn, a Beta Z, all right, the prodigy. Other than that, the, the Telosians are by far the strongest uh, mental manipulators or telepaths that have been shown in Star Trek canon. Here's some questions that I personally had and some observations that I personally had about the Telosians because when I was a kid, I used to wonder were the Telosians bad or were the Telosians good? You know what I mean? Now, anybody who's familiar with the episode knows that a spaceship supposedly crashed on the surface. We don't know that if it if it was due to manipulation by the Telosians, though. All right. So a spaceship crashed on the surface. The only survivor was a female. Now, this is the thing. The Telosians can read your mind like nothing. All right. They they is like a normal thing. When they read her mind, they should have seen images of how she was put together, how she looked, how people from her species was organized, all right? But for some reason, they chose not to do that and to guesswork putting her back together. Now, the thing could be, it could be assumed that the Tathosians did this so that um, she would have more of a desire to stay on the world that they on, on Talos and not seek leaving because of how grotesque she looked now. But no matter what the situation was, they got this lady and they brought her into their society. And the thing is, is that they were looking to experiment and figure out, hey, what is this? All right. What, what, what is this life form? OK, now, inevitably, in experimentation, you do things that the person being experienced or the thing being experimented on doesn't like. And uh, they can punish you when you're not cooperative. You'll find out about that. And it could be shown that, hey, if you do something that the Telosians don't like, they will inflict mental pain on you. Look, the unpleasant alternative of punishment. was 
something that she she was scared of. Like they had conditioned her to receive this 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 negative response whenever she didn't respond the way that they wanted her to. All right. So that isn't a good thing. Now, we also know that the higher intellect a species gets, right, the less they're in tune with their sympathy or empathy size, things that higher life forms consider primitive. So it could be that the Telosians weren't, were neither good or bad. They were just uh, very intelligent beings that were trying to figure out how to make uh, this experiment work, how to figure out this particular life form, which again is odd because they have extreme telepathy. Now, let's talk about the introduction of Pike and his crew. Pike receives a signal, a transmission, basically from Talos 4, and they all go. They beam down and they find survivors. They're interacting with the survivors, everything. You know, it was also something I want to talk about. One of the other questions that I get a lot when it comes to this particular mini movie is, hey, if the Commodore was a uh, hologram, how did they beam him and Kirk from off the shuttlecraft onto the Enterprise, right? And I have two explanations for that. One being the second favorite of mine, which is the Telosians are able to make, are able to manifest real hallucinations, which I say at the second of mine, it's like way down on the list, way down on the list. But the first one is this. If everybody is under the influence of the Telosians at will, because they are in effect within the Telosians te telepathic uh, manipulation field, because the Enterprise was receiving Telosian images, then the transporter chief would have seeing what the Telosians wanted him to see. They could have carried that particular subterfuge on as long as they wanted. There's something that you have to realize. This whole setup was strictly to get a male counterpart for Vena, basically, to conduct this experiment. And I'll let Vena explain it to you a little bit better. In the minds of zoo specimens like me, better than a theater to them. They create an illusion for you. They watch you react, feel your emotions. They have a whole collection of specimens, descendants of life brought back long ago from all over this part of the galaxy. Which means they had to have more than one of each animal. Please. They'll need a pair of humans. To Everything that they've seen, all of the scanners, all of the readings, all of the transmissions, uh, everything that everybody on the bridge heard, everything that they experienced uh, from the moment they got into the telepathic field and down to the surface was all an illusion, a mass illusion per perpetrated by the Telosian. So basically, we need something to happen to keep Kirk occupied so that he won't interfere with the mission that's going on, that Spock has going on. So the Telosians come up with a big old court-martial. Now, it can be argued that the Commodore was kind of against Spock, right? And it could be argued that Kirk, if he let the Commodore have his way, it would have been a very short court-martial. But I believe that they flip-flopped a lot on it because it was Kirk who was like, hey, you know what? I want to see where this mystery imaging is coming from. Because again, Kirk is who he is and he is by true definition an explorer. And, and an explorer loves to solve mysteries and it can't stand a mystery that's unsolvable. We talked about Spock. We talked about the Telosians. Now let's talk more about the third player in this mini movie, and that is Captain Christopher Pike. Now, I've been trying to figure out for decades if Pike was saying no continuously because he was afraid to go to Talos or if he was saying no continuously because he didn't want Spock to get in trouble, all right, and face the death penalty, have a ruin of a promising career. So let's go into the type of person that Pike is. Pike loves his crew. Pike loves those who serve underneath him. Pike 
as shown in Strange New Worlds, have the ability to change his future, right? But he seen what would be the result of the cadets that he would have saved, all right? Now, the thing about this type of person is they care more about others than themselves. That's established. So could he have been saying, no, I don't want to go to Talos because of himself or because of the welfare welfare of one of his subordinates and friends. I'm going to have to say both. Why do I say that? Again, I go into the question that has always plagued me when watching this mini movie. And that is, is it better to be free caged or to be caged free? Through the information we received from the episode, The Cage, and from the flashbacks and things that happened in a menagerie, we get to understand that, yes, the Telosians are experimenting on people. They're experimenting on their guests, but it's the experimentation in a bad way. So if you think about it, the Telosians were basically like, hey, listen, um, we're going to put you in certain memory situations that you've had. These memories are going to be super real. They're going to be as real as the it happening in reality to you okay now all you have to do is play along you just have to play along man do it do what we ask and you can have the best life ever however if you try to escape if you try to hurt us if you try anything outside of those particular boundaries that we've set we're going to give you nightmares that are reality and cause you pain and suffering all right and Pike was the type of person that was like, hey, listen, I'm going to get up out of here because I don't want to be here. I'm an explorer. I need to be out exploring. And no matter how beautiful it is, this is still a cage. Now, we even went so far as the Telosians being like, hey, listen, um, I see that this isn't a suitable mate for you. Uh, we'll bring some mates from your ship. So that, you know, so basically they kidnap some people. Now, the thing is this. We always talk about good and evil when it comes to species in Star Trek that exist on a higher plane. When we talk about people like Gary Mitchell, when he started to become omnipotent, um, he asked the question, what good are morals to a God? You, you, you know what I mean? When you think of people like Q, um, his moral set is very small. All right. So. When you think about the Telosians, when you think about uh, their abilities to do things, they could have destroyed the ship just like they said at any minute. They could have made them push the wrong button, initiated auto self-destruct, man, run it, Grant made the ship run into a moon or anything. You, you know what I mean? They could have made them push a button that shut off life support or turned everything cold or jettisoned everybody into space. However, they did not. And they let the Enterprise go on its way at the end of the episode. Scared off the first second. Maybe it was. It's what I tried to explain in the briefing room. Their power of illusion is so great we can't be sure of anything we do, anything we see. Now, one could argue that the humans found a way to combat the Telosians' telepathy. But really? No. Did they really figure out how to do that? Um, especially for long term. No, no. Remember I said the Telosians are super, super powerful. So did Pike want to go to Talos, right? At the beginning, I must say, no, he did not want to go to Talos. He didn't want to be in Talos. He did not want to be on Talos when he was there. He didn't want to be experimented on. He didn't want to be a lab mouse. All right. And he didn't want the girl that he was with to be a lab mouse, but she had been so conditioned by the Telosians that she was like, look, I'm going to just, I'm going to stay here. I can't, I can't see myself outside of here looking the way that I am put together the way that I am. Right. And one has to ask, I wonder if Starfleet Medical would have been able to do anything with her. So then we get back into, well, why does Spock do it? Why this Spock, knowing that pick, that Captain Pike would didn't want to be on Talos, he knew Captain Pike didn't want to be a prisoner, 
and he did and he knew that Captain Pike didn't want to be a lab rat. Why did he disobey Starfleet regulations? I mean, like extreme Starfleet regulations, like there was the general order 12, man, you go to Talos, man, and you the death penalty. You know what I mean? Why did he um, put his crew in that particular situation? Why did he do that? Now, one could say, again, Spock will force his will upon you if he believes that logically it's the best thing to do. All right. So let's examine it from that point. Let's examine it from that particular standpoint of what we know of Spock. Now, I need you guys to understand that at this time, although Spock was super logical, Spock uh, didn't shy away from his emotional side and all of that. He hadn't yet taken the uh, the full colonar, I believe it was called, or the full right of eliminating your emotions from you. He did that by the time of the motion picture. All right, which is why in the early seasons of early episodes of Star Trek, you will see Spock smile or laugh or do something like that because he was on the path to taking that particular uh, ritual, Vulcan ritual, but he hadn't completed it until the uh, until the motion picture, the first one. So we got we got to understand that Spock has some untamed human in him. All right. Now, Spock knew all of these things about Pike. But Spock also knew the same thing that Bones did that we talked about earlier in the episode. He also had the same feelings of his friend and former captain that he did um, along the same lines of some of the irrational things he used to do for Kirk and Bones during the canon, during a uh, canon of Star Trek as well. So it could be, and this is what I firmly believe that Spock was like, listen, I don't want my old captain sitting in a room, man, with this blinking light. Um, he can go to Talos and experience any memory that he wants to, any memory that this lady wants to in reality and have it play out any way that he wants with the use of his legs, arms, abilities, running back and forth. He felt to himself and he rationalized it logically that this would be the best end path for his friend and his former captain. I also venture far enough to believe that the reason that Spock showed this vi these video clips, um, knowing that uh, Pike was going to have to be the other level senior officer that was going to be there for the court martial, showing Pike, hey, listen, man, through these images, this is what you could be doing. It's no longer a matter of being an experiment or anything like that. It's a matter of you being free and untethered. But the question still remains, is it better to be free caged or caged and free? And that is what everybody who watches this particular mini movie will have to eventually tussle with and ask themselves. If I was put into this just messed up situation that Pike was put into and I can exist in a cage, but free in my mind, all right, or to exist totally free, but in a cage physically. Either one of them is pretty much jacked up situation. But if you had to make that choice, which one would you choose? Now, this has been an examination of the cage, the menagerie one and two, which I like to call the cage mini movie. If you guys have seen it, or if you guys um, haven't seen it, watch it. Let me know what you thought, put it in the comments. Put down, put, uh, let me know what you guys thought of the examination and anything you would add or dispute or debate. But either way, thank you for watching. Thank you guys for being Canaanites and subscribers. And as always, oh, Marina Bell, hit the button, you know, the like button, all that good stuff. And if you've stuck with me this long, hey, thank you. I really appreciate it. And as always, peace, recycle, and say the whales. You guys be cool.